Okay, it's 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 five o'clock in Stonington, Connecticut. Um, we are actually live streaming this presentation by Gretchen, uh, and for those people who are uh, um, joining us on on live stream, you can hit the chat button and ask whatever questions you want. So um, please, we're encourage, uh, encouraging one and all to ask questions as we go forward with the presentation. Uh, my name is Ned York, and uh, I actually grew up in Stonington. Um, I now live with my English wife and, uh, and uh, live in London, um, but I come back periodically. And uh, my friend Gretchen has just uh, written and published her third book, and that's why we're here tonight. Um, first off, I would like to thank the staff of the library, and in particular, Michaela, who has been indispensable <laughs> and uh, really has helped us make this evening happen. So I thank you very much. Um, I, I'm really happy to see everyone here tonight because I think that you're in for a real treat. Um, it's my pleasure and a distinct honor um, to introduce my longtime friend, Gretchen Dykstra, who's just written a book uh, called Echoes from Wuhan, um, The Past is Prologue. Uh, I've known Gretchen for over 40 years now, um, and I can attest to her good character in that time. So, um, Gretchen grew up in Haverford, um, Pennsylvania, right outside of Philadelphia. She graduated from the Shipley School, and uh, then she went on and earned her Bachelor of Art from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. She left Wisconsin and moved to New York City, where she earned a master's degree from uh, the Bank Street School, um, Bank Street Graduate School of Education. After attaining her degree, she taught at the professional uh, children's school near Lincoln Center and uh, was, a freelance, was a freelance writer for several years before actually going to um, China in 1979. So in 1979, uh, following the tumultuous um, cultural revolution in China, the Chinese government decided to kind of switch tax, and they hired 100 American, quotes, foreign expert teachers, which included uh, Gretchen, to teach English as well as English literature at colleges and universities throughout China. And Gretchen was assigned to teach in Wuhan, um, which you can see on the, the map up there. And I will, I will leave this part of the presentation to Gretchen in due course. So after her two years spent in China, she returned to New York City, um, and she held a number of varied and very impressive positions. She started out working in the nonprofit sector and worked for a number of national uh, philanthropic organizations. In the mid-1980s, New York City Charter Revision Commission was formed to review the entire organization, function, procedures, and policies of, of the city government. And Gretchen played an important part of that because she was the, the focal point. She was the liaison person between the commission and citizens groups throughout the five boroughs, as well as the press and other media outlets. Um, after the Charter Commission was successfully wound up because the referendum was successful, Gretchen's next position, uh, she was hired as the uh, founding president of the Times Square Business Improvement District. Um, the Times Square Business Improvement District is composed was composed of an alliance of 550 business property owners who owned restaurants, theaters, hotels, et cetera, in and around uh, Times Square. And obviously, the idea behind the bid was to restore the, the faded glory days of Times Square. 
Um, Gretchen was in that position for seven years. And during that seven years, I did ask her what, was, what were the high points of her time at uh, the Times Square Business Improvement District. And Gretchen very, very quickly said, um, being able to lower the ball on uh, the New Year's Eve celebration. <laughs> But I know that the next day, she also spent going around on the sanitation truck uh, with, with the workers from that district. Um, so that was a great experience, which led to her next uh, position, where um, uh, Mayor Michael Blumenthal appointed her uh, as his, oh, Blum, excuse me, uh, um, his administration's uh, Commissioner of Consumer Affairs, a position which he held for more than three years. Uh, then, of course, in 2001, the Twin Towers were destroyed and the Pentagon was attacked. Um, and subsequently, Gretchen um, b was appointed the following, uh, the, the founding president and CEO of the National 9-11 uh, Memorial and Museum Foundation. Um, however, Quite frankly, she left that within an, uh, a year because of the divisive internal politics of the organization. And it was at this point, Jenny knows about that, it was at this point that uh, Gretchen took a real um, uh, tack in her career direction and uh, struck out and really concentrated on her writing. Um, her first book was published in 2017, and it's called uh, Pinery Boys, Pinery Boys, um, Songs and Song Catching in the Lumberjack Era. Uh, the book, in part, is uh, a biography of Gretchen's grandfather, Franz Rickaby, uh, who uh, collected um, songs among the, the shanty boys and the river um, pilots. Uh, and lumberjacks of the upper Midwest. In 2019, she uh, wrote her, finished her second book, which was called Civic Pioneers, Local Stories from a Changing America, 1895 to 1915. Um, the book profiles eight uh, cities and 15 important and creative leaders who brought innovative programs um, and solutions that sh have shaped uh, local governments in, in America. Um, next, of course, came uh, Echoes of Wuhan, The Past is Prolonged. And I will say at this point, we're now at 2019, uh, Gretchen came to stay with Alex and myself uh, at 9 Omega Street, and she brought her manuscript with her, um, and she would read to us as uh, we were making dinner, um, clearing the dishes, um, washing up, et cetera, et cetera. And Alex and I thought that it was really interesting and very, very engaging because Gretchen's style is really one of telling stories. She really excels and this book, um, shows how gifted she is at a storyteller. And I won't say anything more about the, the stories and the tales and the adventures. I will leave that up to Gretchen. Um, I simply want to round out the introduction by saying that Gretchen has uh, published uh, in the New York Times, the New York Daily News, uh, the Californian Historian, and the North Dakota Quarterly. Um, Gretchen has been a writer in residence at the New York City Public Library since 2019, and she is currently working on her fourth book, which is about Berea College. Uh, Berea is an institution uh, in uh, eastern uh, uh, Kentucky in Appalachia, and she's very, very dedicated to uh, finishing that book uh, in the not too distant future. So one, one last factoid uh, in this introduction, is that Gretchen's uh, uh, two covers, um, her second and third book, uh, have been uh, illustrated and designed by um, Rachel Adam 
Rogers, who's Cynthia Dixon's Adam's daughter, and she's done a fine job on that. So uh, with that, I give you Gretchen Dykstra. He forgot to tell you what I did in kindergarten. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, I just took my shoes off, and I haven't pointed out where Wuhan is yet. Um, I second what Ned said about Makala. This has been a real treat to get to know her in this lovely library. I've been here several times, never in this capacity, but I haven't been here since all the work was done, and it's really beautiful. And so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so, yes, as Ned said, in 1979, I went off to China. Excuse me for being barefoot, but I have to show you. This is Wuhan. Um, it is, uh, I, this is my COVID project. I was working on the Berea book when COVID hit, and so I couldn't go back to Kentucky. And I thought, now's the time to write about Wuhan. Everybody's heard about Wuhan. In the 1970, no, nobody, myself included, had ever heard of it. So this was timely. Um, I was hired to teach English, but a little bit of context. When uh, President Carter signed the normalization agreement, that's when things began to really pick up in China, and all sorts of agreements were struck, including the Chinese wanted to hire 100 people and place them in colleges around the country because China knew, Deng Xiaoping knew, that without English, they could never take off. And um, Deng Xiaoping was very committed to what were known as the four modernizations. Those of us who were hired um, had no choice in where we were sent. And I was sent to a small teacher's college on the southern bank of the Yangtze River, which was at that time about 7 million people. It's now 11 million. There were six Americans there, four at the local university, and one other American woman at Wuhan Teachers College, and that was it. Um, for foreigners in Wuhan. Um, this, just to give it, um, just to remind you, was before the internet, it was before email, it was the end of the Cultural Revolution. There were no books in the library. The only English books were um, a Howard Fast and some Charles Dickens, none of which had ever been checked out. Um, but more importantly, and much to, my, uh, to the point of my story, is that I taught two groups. I taught what, who were known as the worker, peasant, soldier, students. These were the people, the young people, who lived through the Cultural Revolution, who were, in fact, most of them either workers or peasants who were picked out and sent to colleges. And those worker, soldier, peasant students, for the most part, were party members. And they had come to Wuhan Teachers College when it opened in 1976, after the Cultural Revolution, be, to be taught English as the future English teachers. And they were all taught by former Russian teachers. And those of you who remember your Chinese history know that in 19, the mid-60s, China and the Soviet Union parted ways. And so there were 65 people in my foreign language department. Only English was being taught with two English teachers. All the rest were Russian teachers. Um, the other class I taught were the now famous class of 1977. And in 1977, Deng Xiaoping said, we have to make sure that the best and the brightest go to colleges. So they gave entrance examinations. Um, 100,000 young people took them, 10,000 passed um, in 10 different disciplines, including English. So um, we were teaching extraordinarily smart, curious young people. Um, only one of whom I knew to be a party member. And the reason I differentiate that is I think you'll see in what I'm going to read a difference between those who grew up um, abiding by the chaos of the Cultural Revolution and those who weren't. Um, I'm going to read about uh, three sections. Um, I thought I would, I, I'm going to tell you the first day at teaching, and then when things got a little better, I've molded them together. Um, the first activity I had off of the campus, um, and then something that happened my final week two years later. Um, the campus uh, was, as I said, on the southern banks of the, of the Yangtze River, surrounded. Um, we had fields that peasants worked on, but otherwise it was mostly um, heavy machinery and, and textile factories in Wuhan. Um, there were about 1,600 kids in 10 different disciplines. 
Um, there, most of them lived, went home on Saturday. They were from Wuhan. I lived on the campus and I was, as I say, a prisoner of privilege. I had the largest apartment on the campus. I had two young women who took care of me. I had two cooks. I had a man who stoked the only furnace on campus, so I had heat. I had the only, me and Janet, the other American, we had the only two mattresses on campus. We had air conditioners, because Wuhan is one of the three ovens of China. Um, and so, but I wasn't allowed off campus with anybody without permission. Nobody was allowed to have me over. And at that time, um, there were only 16 places in all of China that were open to foreigners. I was, as an employee of the Chinese government, I carried a small red booklet that had to be stamped if and when I traveled, which luckily I did a fair amount of. Um, so I'm going to start on my first day of class. Uh, this is in October of 1979. Um, get up, Gretchen. It's Monday. Time for your first class. Diana and I climbed a wooden staircase to the third floor of the main building, a square, whitewashed, three-story concrete building with unpainted window frames. The classrooms were linked by an external hallway with waist-high wooden railings. The unadorned halls were wide enough to accommodate students and teachers when the loudspeakers went off mid-morning and we did 10 minutes of calisthenics. My classroom had faded whitewashed walls, fluorescent lights hanging from high ceilings and large windows that let in good light. I arrived early for the 8.30 class, hoping to beat the students, but all 15 were already there, quietly poring over books at wooden desks. The young girls and I had learned quickly to call all unmarried students, girls or boys, sat in the first three rows, the boys in one back row. When I entered slightly self-consciously, a girl in the front jumped up to her feet. Welcome, Miss Gretchen. I am Chin Yu. On behalf of the class of 1977, I welcome you to Wuhan Teachers College. As the leader of classroom studies, I will help you with your needs. Confident and warm, her English was strong, her accent minimal. I said hello, feeling more confident. I'm sorry, I have to take my glasses off. Um, that this would all work out. I put my things on a desk in front and called the class to order. I introduced myself, giving more details than Dean too had done about my, grand, my background and family and life in New York the day before. I tried hard not to disappoint them without embellishing the truth. Then I said, I have much to learn about China and Wuhan, so we will all learn together. I do not know how well you speak, read, or write English, and I would like to know a bit about each of you. So please stand and introduce yourself. We can start in the back. I pointed to a bespeckled boy. He looked like a young man, but he passed with a slight shake of his head. Anyone? No one. I waited a few seconds. Well, let me ask you questions. When and how did you learn English? I pointed to another boy, but he averted his eyes. The next victim shook her head. Maybe I better use simpler language and speak more slowly. My apartment is very nice. It is big and sunny with comfortable furniture, I said, enunciating every word. I hope you will visit me. They paid close attention, their eyes glued on me, but no comment. Can someone please describe your dormitory room to me? I pointed to a girl. She giggled. This was painful. Assuming they all had attended the reception the day before, I changed course. Can anyone tell me about my family? How many sisters do I have? What does my father do? I waited, no responses. Maybe I would get an answer if I framed the question like a quiz. Did my grandmother move to a dairy farm after my grandfather died? A few nodded ever so gently, but said nothing. I was scrambling like a circus hawker selling no tickets. I understand Chinese names often mean something. Can someone volunteer to translate his or her name? No one. Maybe they did not understand a thing I was saying, and I was getting worried, not just for that day, but for the next two years. Did they even know their ABCs? I should have brought diagnostic tests to gauge their English proficiency, but I knew nothing about English proficiency tests. I was desperate, so I tried that tired old trick the threat. I spoke slowly, carefully enunciating every word. In class, we will read together and you will write. 
I will base your grade in part on that written work and in part on your participation in class. I want everyone to ask questions and offer comments. Discussion and disagreement make for a vibrant class. Can anyone define vibrant in this context? No response. Clearly in uncharted water, I tapped. Does anyone have a question about what I just said about your grades? I was swinging the sword of Damocles above their head and it worked. A young man raised his hand. I nodded at him, a tall, handsome guy, maybe 22 or so, with a wide face and large eyes, stood up from the back row and pulled from the back pocket of his olive green pants a piece of crinkled paper, which he carefully unfolded. Looking down at it and then up at me, he asked in perfect English, what is the difference between the Subcommittee on Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission and which has more power? Whoa! I took a breath and told myself not to ask him where he learned his English. How do you know about the Trilateral Commission, I asked. Without missing a beat, he asked, how do you? I thought it was a secret in your country. I know about it from a magazine called The Rolling Stone. How do you know about it? I know about it from a magazine called The People's Daily, he answered, citing China's state-owned newspaper. And instantaneously, my fear of the job disappeared. <laughs> By the third week, I was making some progress, shaping classes that worked better for the young teachers in the class of 77 and for me too. I pulled out my anthology of short stories and relying on two young typists in the English department, neither of whom could speak English, we produced materials. They type a slow but remarkably accurate process and then run, run copies off on the clunky but functional old-fashioned mimeograph machine. In class, I'd introduce the author if I could, as I had no reference books yet, and then, depending on the length of the story, the students took turns reading it aloud, practicing their pronunciation and intonation. That was not the best way to appreciate the artistry, but they were used to that method and it helped their enunciation. We then discussed the structure, the content, the characters, and the themes. And for homework, I usually assign some sort of repetition or an extension of those discussions. Most 77 students and young teachers had little trouble with the content and vocabulary, and most picked up quickly on structure, but themes and characters were tricky, and we constantly stumbled into cultural confusion. In Ernest Hemingway's short story, The Day's End, a little boy has a high fever and complains to his parents. His father tries to comfort him, but when the father leaves his son's room, hoping the boy will get some sleep, the child fears he's going to die. The 77 students understood every word, but were perplexed by the boy's actions. I read The Old Man in the Sea in Chinese, said Zhang Yan. In that novel, the old man is a vivid example of bourgeois individualism. So is this child an example of bourgeois individualism too, she asked. How do you think he displays individualism, I asked her. The child is naughty, she responded. He shut his parents' window without their permission. He was in their bed without permission, called another student, adding, Chinese children would never do that. The father told the boy not to be scared, but the child disappeared, said, disobeyed, said another student unequivocally. Do children always obey their parents? Do they believe that parents are always right, I asked, pushing them to be more introspective, more psychologically insightful, more Western. But I was misunderstanding classic Chinese filial piety. Culturally determinative, piety demands respect and reverence for one's parents and demands repayment to ancestors and parents for their sacrifices. Confucius said filial piety brought harmony and order to Chinese families and therefore to society. People might argue if Confucianism is still relevant but in two years, I never once heard a young person complain about a parent. And the few times I saw people with their parents, I was struck by the friendly formality. There was something wonderfully ironic about Ernest Hemingway, the iconic American writer, giving rise to a lesson in Chinese cultural history. What is so breathtaking and at times subversive 
about literature is that no matter what the language, what the culture, or what the style, it raises questions for the reader. Then breaking this strain of my thought, Bing Shin said definitively, children do not think about dying. That seemed correct to me and led to a discussion about authors and their imaginations, the role of fiction in Hemingway and his notorious machismo. It was all new to them and fun for me. Eventually, when I had more books, I structured my classes around the stages of American life, childhood, youth, love, marriage, work, and death. We read short stories, novels, magazine articles, poems, and even advertisements introducing different forms and styles through good writers and interesting topics. It gave them glimpses of American life, and we stayed within my comfort zone, not an insignificant consideration. But for some, it raised serious issues. Yan Li Wei was an intense, hardworking student who eagerly read everything I assigned, often multiple times. One day, he took me aside and said with great seriousness, Gretchen, I cannot read anymore. Thinking he meant he thought he was not a good reader, I responded, I don't understand. You are a very strong reader. I cannot read anymore, he repeated. I get too involved with the characters. But that means you understand what you are reading. You understand what the author is saying. But I begin to think I'm the character, like Larry, the little boy who hated his father. I had worried that Frank O'Connor's My Oedipus Complex might be too psychologically loaded, but the story was sweet, and my choices were limited by the anthologies I had, as well as the style and the language the authors used. He clearly had understood the story. Young Li Wei, you are making me proud of you. Please keep reading. But if the leaders find out, they will criticize me. That was heartbreaking. Then we will not tell them, will we, I said. And he kept reading. Um, as I said, I was not allowed off of campus with any students, so I was eager um, to have the woman who took care of my daily life organize trips for me um, and to take me around to see things. And so I'm going to read um, what I did on my first outing off campus, if I can find it. Oh, sorry. I lobbied Secretary Chang, my daily living handler, to find me excursions off campus. My first was a basketball game. Secretary Chang arranged for Xiao Wang, that was my translator, and she'll come back into this, Xiao Wang and me to go to the final round of a tournament among physical education students in the city. Slightly am amused by Secretary Chang's initial effort and surprised that Diana the basketball nut and my colleague did not want to go, I was nonetheless eager to see another place and experience another aspect of regular life. The small open air concrete stadium devoid of bunting signs, electric scoreboards or snacks was already packed when we arrived. There were only a few other women in the crowd that I guess numbered about 500 people and I was the only foreigner. We were escorted to a center row where a few high-ranking cotters, that's the English translation of party leaders, from other institutes sat. Some seemed to sit up straighter, as if being seen with a foreigner was somehow special. Ironically, Americans had become the new status symbol in the leftist city of Mao's revolution. We sat down. A steady stream of young men, sometimes three or four abreast, poured into the stadium, swamping the bleachers, the aisles, and even the edges of the court. With no tickets needed, too many people had come, and the stadium could not accommodate them. Suddenly, a stern voice bellowed from the loudspeakers and ordered the host students to make room in the bleachers for their visitors. A few obeyed, setting off a veritable human wave with newcomers pushing seated students. Elbows were out, voices were raised, fists were swung, and several people fell. It was chaos. This disorder is horrible, Xiao Wang snapped at me. Clear the court, clear the court, the voice on the loudspeaker insisted to no, to no avail. Clear the court. And then he yelled, it is impossible to proceed. Everyone immediately go. Leave the stadium immediately. Leave immediately. He was emphatic. The game has been canceled. Everyone must leave. The leaders have canceled the game. 
And as soon as the voice mentioned the leaders, the entire stadium went silent. All the fans, every single one, those seated and those standing, got up or turned, climbed down the concrete bleachers, and filed out quietly and orderly. In a split second, frustrated, almost violent young men turned into obedient automatons. No one protested the decision. No one demanded better organization. No one questioned the planning. They merely walked away. The shift in tone was dramatic, the response stunning. Isn't anyone angry, I asked Xiao Wang. Why should they be angry, she answered. The leader said leave, so they are leaving. I stood up, assuming we too would go, but one of the cotters in my row motioned me to sit back down. Aren't we going, I asked Xiao Wang. No, as soon as these hooligans leave, the game will start. What? I was incongruous. What will happen when they discover they were tricked? Nothing, she asked plainly. The leaders told them to leave, so they will leave. The leaders know best. Those boys are cultural revolution hooligans. What can they say? Mix classic Confucian respect for hierarchy with a fear of authority, and you get this reaction, I thought. Even in Madison, Wisconsin, at the height of anti-war protests, when cops in riot gear with tear gas moved down streets in formation against students with rocks, I did not feel as close to or fearful of mob violence as I did that night in the Wuhan basketball stadium. Scores of young men, all dressed alike, hungry for diversion, a city with so little to do, found inadequate facilities and no organizational foresight, and they were angry. And then it was over, completely silently. Back at the college, I told other young teachers and students what had happened. Their reactions were radically different, and I wondered if they reflected different politics. Every young teacher to a person, and most were party members, agreed with the leader's decision to stop the game and then disperse the crowd. They complimented the leaders for maintaining order and demanding harmony, and they said nothing about the unfairness or the inefficiency of the organizers. They expressed no surprise by the immediate halt to the rise in tension. The 77 students, with few if any party members among them, voiced a range of reactions. Some believed the disorder was virtuous, proof of a universal desire for self-expression. Some analyzed the source of the potential violence, arguing that poverty breeds disorder. Others blamed political oppression. And one student offered this prediction, disorder in China is inevitable, it happens every hundred years. You will see. And now the last week of my, um, my stay, and this is 1981. Um, where is it? Sorry. I'm sorry. No, it's not the matchmaker chapter. Um, I'm not reading the matchmaker chapter. Uh, the chapter is called, And Another Surprise. I will not be available today if you need me, Xiao Wang said, with a formality that had emerged since our awkward talk in their room. It's a different story. A scheduling conflict was a first, but it did not matter. I rarely needed her on an ordinary day. Okay, thanks for telling me, I said nonchalantly. Why? Some American college presidents are coming to visit, and I will be their translator, she answered without hes any hesitation, as if Americans coming to campus was a daily occurrence. Wuhan Teachers College was closed to foreigners. Um, no foreigners were ever brought there unless I had invited them. What? American college presidents, I said incredulously, never having heard a word of this. Am I invited? I asked the leaders to invite you, she answered, but they said no. They told me not to tell you until this morning. They say it's none of your business. There it was again, that phrase, that chasm of distrust and secrecy. I was the only person in two years who had brought any foreigners to campus. How could they not know I would like to say hello to other American visitors? How could they not think it was a good idea to connect us? 
Offended and angry, I retreated to the foreign language section of the library where I always felt more comfortable near the handful of English language magazines and accepted by librarian Lee in his musty refuge. One of my students was there and the poor kid got an earful. I attacked his nasty college, the nasty leaders, and the empty rhetoric about the friendship between our two great nations. I lambasted him for things he could neither help nor understand. He didn't know what hit him, but he was patient with my outburst and sympathetic to my woes and my temper tantrum passed. Later that morning, as he day daydreamed out the second floor window, he spotted the Americans heading towards the library and called, Gretchen, here they come. I, sm I saw a small group of middle-aged men and women of all different sizes and shapes looking positively heavenly in colorful and varied clothing. I flew out of the reading room down the wide staircase right smack into a tall American man wearing a khaki safari jacket and a Mao cap carrying a public television tote bag. Who are you? He asked in amazement. I ignored Dean too, who was at his side, looking distinctly uncomfortable with my sudden appearance. Oh, they didn't tell you I was here? I've been here two years, I said sarcastically. The other Americans then entered, escorted by college leaders, Xiao Wang, my translator, and Chen Li, the Bryn Mawr bound student whose scholarship I had won for her. The Americans were ooing and eyeing about their English. Welcome, I called, thrusting out my hand. I'm Gretchen. I guess you have met my translator, Xiao Wang, and my student, Chen Li, who is headed to Bryn Mawr College. They're good, aren't they, I asked. The Americans looked baffled. We chatted briefly, but they were on a tight schedule, so our visit was brief. We arranged to meet for dinner that evening across the river. Sponsored by the American Association of State Colleges, they were exploring possible exchange programs representing seven small public colleges, including Pomona Polytech, Western Illinois, and the University of Alabama in Huntsville. Fascinated by all they had seen in Wuhan and elsewhere, their visit to Wuxia confused them, and they were bursting with questions for me. The leaders had told them the college had no English books and never mentioned the library I left behind. Why, they asked. The college needed scholarships, but they never mentioned the two I had found. Why? The leaders said they needed foreign experts, but never mentioned Diana and me. Why? Those were not lies, just omissions, but the leaders also told the visitors that they were the first Americans to come to the college, saying they were a symbol of friendship between our two great nations. Why would they say we were the first when we are not, one college president said. China, this is my answer, China wants desperately to be back in the center of the world. And to that end, the leaders want and need something from all of you. The best way to get what they want is to give you what they think you want, to be first, to be special, to be individual. It costs them nothing to give that to you. China understands America far better than we understand China. Thank you. <laughs> I'm happy to ask answer any questions if I can. Oh, Ned. <laughs> I get to ask the first question. Um, as, as everyone can see, this really is a personal remembrance, not really a political track, but it's really storytelling <clears throat> about Gretchen's adventures, um, her riding her bicycle around Wuhan, matchmaking, there's there's actually wife beating, there's a murder. Um, it's very, very rich uh, about her time there. Um, what I was interested in asking you is actually twofold. One is this was an experience that happened more than 40 years ago. Um, and how is it that she so vividly describes all of these incidents, uh, one after another, after another, after another? And then the second part of my question is, why today? Why something that happened in uh, 1989, uh, 1979 is relevant in 2020? Um, when there's nothing to do on a college campus, the journal becomes your best friend. 
So I kept a very detailed journal every night. Um, I have, I think, 25 of them. And my family and friends kept many of the letters. So I was able to reconstruct that. I also would be um, dishonest not to tell you I had tried writing this book before. And it had been rejected. So I had shelved it. And I, and I took it back out. Um, and then the internet is helpful. I mean, I couldn't actually remember what the ride was like from the airport to the Friendship Hotel in Beijing, but the internet can tell you that. Um, but it was really the journals and the letters. Um, Ned's second question, though, it goes to the heart of, of when I decided to write the book. I knew that it wouldn't be of interest if it was just about 40 years ago, although I will say that some of the folks who were there long ago think that it's, um, it's historically kind of precious because this is the earliest um, accounting of anybody in America at that time. But the reason I wrote it is really the last fifth of the book. And I take you through what happened to four of those students. And, um, and, and I use those students to illustrate what were the most salient qualities that I took away from my experience of the Chinese people. The first was their extraordinary dedication to education for all people. Um, that was unwavering. I have never seen anything like it. And so that brings up all sorts of issues when we talk about affirmative action and we talk about minority rights in schools. Um, the Chinese and other East Asians, their dedication, and it goes back to Confucius. I mean, he talked about educating uh, people in order to make an orderly society. So one of them is the personification of that dedication to education. Another one who lives in Toronto um, is resilient. Um, she was, in fact, divorced. She was, in fact, beaten when she went to pick up her stuff. I visited her at home. Um, she w moved to Toronto, and she's become a Taoist. Um, and for those of you who know anything about Taoism, you know that that old, classic, ancient philosophy religion of China believes that the world is one, and that the universe is interconnected. And she has become, uh, well, she's written several books. She's a poet, and she um, gives lectures on multicultural art in Toronto, and she is quite an extraordinary person who has all of this sort of background in her. The third is my translator, who ended up coming to America, um, stayed 20 years. I won't ruin all of the story for you, but to tell you that she did end up becoming the head of global compliance for Merck Pharmaceutical Companies. Um, not a lawyer, um, got an MBA, got a master's in English, unbelievably smart. And then, much to my surprise, in 2012, she went back to China. And she went back um, to work for a new technology company. But technology was not her thing. She is now um, 65 years old, and she is the senior vice president of one of the largest software companies in China. Um, I wrote about her because the power of ambition among some of the Chinese is extraordinary, and their capacity uh, for learning new things is extraordinary. And um, then the fourth was a student that I had. It was platonic, but it was um, inappropriate. And um, he was criticized for it. And he ended up murdering his wife in England. And he and I have stayed close friends. I, I visited him in prison. I have seen him since. And he is an example of shame. And anthropologists write that in the West, we're guided or we're inspired by guilt, and in the East, by shame. He shamed himself, um, and he has had a shattered and destroyed life ever since. He works in the back of a Chinese re restaurant in the Midlands somewhere, um, the fast food cook. And he was by far and away my best student, other than my translator. Um, and so those are the stories. It's about education, it's about tradition, it's about ambition, and it's about shame, which are the four things that I learned most about China. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Any other? Yeah. Did you know that you should 
I didn't know a word of Chinese. In fact, I'd only, and I had never studied China. I'd never taught, taken a Chinese history class. Um, however, I had been to China earlier. I went right after normalization with the headmistress of my high school who had taught in China in Beijing for 25 years. And they invited her back and said she could bring a small group with her. So I had been bitten by the utopian bug and I thought, oh, I want to be part of this. But interestingly enough, they refused to give me a teacher. They said, you didn't, you were not hired to learn Chinese, you were hired to teach English. That backfired because my students spoke such good English. I spent all of my time with my students, so I liken it to a fence post. It was very narrow, but very deep. Um, and if I had been trying to learn Chinese, I'd still be trying to learn Chinese, and I wouldn't have spent so much time with my students on the campus. Yeah. I went back in 1982 when my student was, um, when, this, when the student got a scholarship to Haverford College, um, I, they then denied him permission to go. And I was furious and I was angry at myself and I thought he's been denied permission to go to Haverford because of my impropriety. Um, so I was angry. And I was angry at the leaders, so I went to the brand new China Travel Service on 42nd Street, and I had learned a thing by then. I went up and I knocked on the door, and there were two people there, and I said, I'd like to talk to the leader in charge. And um, he, he took me into his office, and we had a long talk about tea and the weather in, in mm -hmm. New York and the beautiful carpet and why I had gone to Wuhan. And then he said, how can I help you? And I said, I promised my students I would go back um, to congratulate them when they graduated from, from college. But there's a problem. You won't let individuals go back to China. And he looked down and he said, that's correct. And I said, I think that's a good policy. He said, you do? I said, you can't have a lot of young Americans and Europeans wandering around China not knowing what they're doing. But I have a problem. And he said, where would you go? And I said, just to Wuhan. He said, do you need an English language translator? I said, no, I, I can get there by myself from Hong Kong. So he said, do you have your passport? Gave me my passport, he stamped it, and I went back to Wuhan for one week to shut the door. And I've never been back. That was the summer of 1982. And I have no intention of ever going back. In part, I was telling Ned and Alex this. Um, at one time, I saw the Yangtze River stopped and there were at least a thousand men with shovels um, shoveling out the banks of the Yangtze River. I am not surprised by the China we see in the pictures today. So I just want to stay with my memories. No, I, have never, I haven't been back. And yeah. This is just so, so delightful to hear, to hear your story. Um, my husband and I were invited to go and visit the Ah. And we did. And we were there for three weeks. Uh -huh. Oh, it was a little background. Why were you invited in 1976? Ah. Were you, did you leave Beijing at all?
Permission. No, he was a PLA general. That's who got to go on the soft cars. Party leaders, foreigners, and PLA soldiers. Fascinating. His hands across his chest. Yes. yes. And I like to, I do not, I have no desire to have to take somebody else's ten years and And for those of you who are listening, we just heard a really wonderful story about a woman who was there in 1976. Um, I'm a little envious. <laughs> <laughs> Although I, I will say that uh, I think like with all bureaucracies, Beijing and Shanghai, once things began to open up, they opened up faster than a place like Wuhan did, which both has a reputation for being the center of the leftist working class, but they also were slow to get the messages. So I think my experience was probably not totally unlike what you would have seen in 1976. Um, fascinating. Anything else? Yeah. Do you think your book will be available in China? It's funny you should ask. <laughs> um, no, I know it won't be. Um, when the U.S.-China trade wars began, one of the first things to go was China will not allow any American, any English language book that has an ISBN number without being first approved by the government. And I've been in touch with a professor at UCLA who writes about Chinese cinema took him 18 months to get a book on China cinema approved. Um, I thought maybe I could send a PDF to one of my students. They know about it now. I can't. Um, they, as of the end of July, no Kindle is allowed. So there's no Ingram books. There's no Barnes and Noble. There's no Amazon. There's no Kindle. Um, no, it's not. And, and I don't want to, um, my, some of my students who live abroad are taking it back with them. Um, but I'm not going to take that risk. Sad, huh? What an irony. Anything else? Well, I, I'd just like to ask you about the title of the book. Because, oh. of course, it's called um, uh, Echoes from Wuhan. But the subtitle is The Past is Played Off. And wh what did you mean by including that phrase? I think it was the way that I capture what happens to those four people. I think it's, uh, I believe that they're all cu cultural traits. And in China, where 96% of the people are Han Chinese, and it's not a multicultural society, I do believe. Um, now, I might be proven wrong, but I do believe that um, tradition, like Confucius or Taoism, I believe education, ambition, and shame are, are very deeply ingrained in the Chinese um, population. So that's what I meant by the past is prologue. People ask me all the time about things like Taiwan and stuff, and I take a pass on that. Um, uh, but I did, I met a, well, definitely. Alex? Well, um, somebody has read the whole book, and I think that's the kind of thing that it I remember reading 
If I heard you correctly, you're asking what is the lesson I take away? I think, it's again, it's those four people at the end. And I will tell you, and this sort of, Rody goes to your question, because this is ironic. I had trouble getting this book published, and I got turned down by independent publishers who were scared of touching a book about China. Once it was published by an independent publisher in Austin, I tried to contract with a well-known um, public media person, social media person for books. She wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. So in a funny kind of way, um, America, at least some parts of it, are nervous. And meanwhile, China is blocking the book from the students. So it's sort of like, gee, that's weird. But Alex, I can't express enough. It's the people that I take away. I don't know that they're all kind and jolly. They're hospitable. They're polite. But those four people who, um, I will tell you, be, well, no, I can't tell you. I promised them I wouldn't say. Um, but there is another story I couldn't tell in this book that is quite extraordinary about my friend in Toronto. Um, the resilience of the Chinese, their seriousness of purpose, um, yes, their nationalism, um, and their seriousness. And when I say shame, by the way, I don't necessarily mean their own loss of faith, but the loss of your faith. If you, in fact, and I made a mistake once, and I shamed some of the young teachers, and I paid a price for it because I shamed them. It, it's a very strong thing, and I do believe that America does not understand China as well as they understand us. I think they read us like, the, like a book. <laughs> so if that can add anything, that would be terrific for me. Louder. We all need to learn about China and the Chinese. And I think your book is a wonderful point. Thank you. Because I think that the Western that we everybody gets a lot of um design or or the things like Western and I think your book is very much so Thank you, Alex. And one story and then I see it's six o'clock. Um I think Maybe this isn't happening so much, but one of the things that struck me, I was once on a bus in Wuhan, and man, a bus in Wuhan in 1980 was an experience. And I sat there watching Chinese elbow out old women trying to get on the bus. And I, you know, I got on my high horse, and I thought, oh, this is outrageous. And then I thought, wait a minute, not one of those old women on a bus would ever be put into a nursing home would never go into a retirement community. They always be taken care of by their family. And so I thought, you know, maybe that's knee jerk Gretchen, but isn't it true that we care about the unwashed masses and don't care as much about our families than the Chinese do? That's another thing I learned. Um, so, and we're both right on that, by the way. But in any case, I've never been back. So that tells you we still have some deep feelings about China, some good and some bad. I'm not a fan of the Communist Party. <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming. This is really a pleasure.